so appreciating anime dubbed in English has always been an uphill battle. Even though more shows are being dubbed overall and at a faster rate than they ever have been before, it's hard to ignore the persistent pushback from many Western fans. Some say that modern dubs just aren't as good as they used to be, and when they talk about how they used to be, chances are, they're talking about Cowboy Bebop. Everyone's putting a lid on something that smells. You're the one still tied to the past, Spike. Little twerp like you sticks his neck out too far. He'll get it cut off, understand? Now don't get too hot-headed, Spike. You haven't seen hot-headed yet, Chet. Here we go! Despite having been produced in the early 2000s when dubbing was still in its infancy, the English version of Cowboy Bebop continues to be considered one of the few gold standards almost 20 years later. And similar to how other commercialized art forms are compared to classics on almost an unconscious level, so too are many modern anime dubs compared to the quality displayed back then. And while this could be considered an apt comparison, it's not always a fair one when considering that the Bebop dub had all the makings of a train wreck waiting to happen. Something that is constantly overlooked by people's often superficial idea of how the industry works. Around the late 90s and early 2000s, people working on English dubs weren't really mentored on how to do much of anything. There was no acting class that taught people how to match lip flaps, and no one knew how to teach someone what it meant to be a voice director. Which does explain why so many dubs from back then really haven't aged well. Listen, uh, you wouldn't by chance have seen this man around the city? Nope, never seen him. I see. <sighs> The supply was low, so the pay was too, and a lot of people ended up in the positions they did virtually by accident. This again? Son of a bitch! At the time, director Kevin Seymour was inundated with projects, so he gave Cowboy Bebop to Mayor Elizabeth McGuinn, even though she was new to ADR. In fact, Bebop was her debut as a director, and the only reason why she went into voiceover was because she fell off a horse. And I don't mean that in the metaphorical sense. I mean she literally fell off a horse and broke her kneecap while working on the Xena Princess Warrior show, which ended her on-camera career for the foreseeable future. And because dubbing mature anime in the early 2000s was still a novel practice, there wasn't much of a standard to follow. But the lack of pressure to meet deadlines and the relative disconnect with the anime fandom in Japan probably helped Mary take the time to listen to everyone's audio as thoroughly as possible, in order to get the best combination of voices to make the dialogue sound natural and have the characters feel constant. This led to the creation of something monumental, and now she's a high-profile voice director working for the likes of Disney. But while I would love for more modern dubs to be given the same degree of care, there's a part of me that feels like there's something more vague and fundamental that led to such a beloved result. A lot of people like to think that actors and directors should be judged by the range of their careers, but they always seem to forget about the range that needs to be demonstrated behind the mic for a character to come off as believable. Too uniform and the performance is monotonous, but too varied and it'll sound inconsistent. To make any animated character seem believable, the actor needs to build off of natural human behavior, something that can't always be boiled down to an immediately recognizable vocal gimmick. Every time Aniplex, Funimation, or Sentai upload a new trailer for their next scheduled English release, the community becomes nothing short of a minefield. Every man, his dog, and his collection of stamps seems to explode over how a 60 second clip managed to utterly disgrace the high art of whatever Japanese cartoon they're attached to. But when people often criticize a dub character's voice, they always seem to forget about the acting, and more often than not, the two are far from synonymous with each other. Think about it, if the characters we love and respect truly do possess the dimension we claim they do, then it's impossible to gauge whether or not an actor is able to portray those subtleties properly when we only listen to single lines in isolation. Acting isn't always about capturing everything about a character instantly. Rather, it's about building a character from the ground up as a means of telling the story itself. It's something that needs to be experienced over time, in a way where the actors completely disappear and all we're left with are the characters on screen going about their everyday lives. Unlike someone else here, I always return what I owe. Gee, what an admirable virtue. I'm really not up for this. This might come off as harsh to some, but it honestly felt wrong to revisit Cowboy Bebop with its original Japanese audio, and it's not surprising that the dub completely overshadowed it. For example, director Shinichiro Watanabe once said that the character of Spike was supposed to be a twist on anime icon Lupin III, and sadly that reflects too literally in the Japanese performance. 
時代遅れのカーボーイさん。While Koichi Yamadera is clearly a great actor, there are times where it sounds like he's putting on two different performances for Spike. When the character acts light and wistful, Yamadera's voice carries with it that trademark sense of goofy cadence you might expect from a more modern anime character. <laughs> But when it's time for him to approach something serious, his voice can drop way too low and weathered to come off as subtle. Now, if you take these individual scenes on their own, there seems to be no issue because Yamadera is putting on a performance to match the specific scene. But when you stitch those scenes together and take in the whole performance across the entire 26 episode run, it can come off as jarring, like two different actors are playing the same role at different points in time. Now, arguably, this juxtaposition was intentional, and those serious scenes are meant to show us the real man behind the laid back facade. But at the same time, you run the risk of making those lighter scenes come off as artificial. While it's not uncommon for real life people to exaggerate their voices in order to sound a certain way depending on their context, all those permutations still need to be grounded in a consistent, natural tone that can be felt from beginning to end. I can't tell when you're joking and when you're not. Yeah, I hear that a lot. These characters are all identifiable by their simplistic personas because, as time goes on, it's revealed that they too are defined by their own lack of progress. Instead of pursuing a life that would help them find out who they are in a solid, overarching narrative, they instead drift aimlessly across the stars as bounty hunters, going from job to job just to stay alive without worrying about the future in order to forget about the past. You may leave final words, or you may bequeath your possessions. Nothing. The world of Bebop is a colorful one, but the more you're exposed, the more scarce and unforgiving it becomes. The gateway accident that destroyed the moon and rendered Earth almost uninhabitable was a huge blow against the possibility of interstellar civilization, which is arguably why the cultures we see in each episode are so fractured from one another. In a way, it's a lot like our own 21st century, where niches keep to themselves and find it hard to see things from an outsider's perspective. You know, kind of like the whole sub versus dub argument itself. And from episode to episode, the voice direction gives just as much believability to these side characters, creating societies that are as diverse as they are wrought with flaws. Although, arguably, the Bebop crew are the outsiders to society in this case, and they can't see any meaning at all, only bounty heads. But they still laugh, they still drive each other crazy, and they still try to get by because that's all they feel like they can do. I don't think the trick to portraying these types of characters properly is to set things up in a way where we can clearly see through those supposed false moments of levity, like some distinct aha moment. But rather, I think the best approach was showing that sometimes those moments where we're goofy are just as important as those moments where we feel like there's nowhere left for us to go. And because they carry the same amount of character, the performances need to carry the same amount of weight and personal significance throughout. The music box is broken. Or is it? It starts to play and a haunting tune fills the air. I awake suddenly from my dream. There is no music box, and yet there it is. A tiny one nestled in my hand. And I awake from my dream again, as if I were peeling an onion. It's a dream no matter how far I go. I can never reach reality. Trapped in an endless nightmare. I think this is why Yamadera's performance is so heavily overshadowed by Steve Blum's, because even on a subconscious level, he knew that an obviously complex character like Spike needs to come off as natural so that the audience doesn't feel like they're being manipulated. You'll notice that Steve doesn't go out of his way to exaggerate any particular emotions. Unlike Yamadera, most of his comedic moments are downplayed so that the dramatic ones creep up on us more fluidly. That means relaxing the whole body so it can react instantly without resistance. You know, without thought. Do you see now? It means becoming like clear water. Spike generally acts aloof and sly, which can be heard in Steve's already naturally weathered tempo. But when things go south, his shouting becomes distinctly hoarse. How you doing, kid? Rotten! You're late, Jet! And I think you can chalk that up to the character having his own well established comfort zone, one that he unwillingly gets forced out of in tense situations. Now, this isn't something that can always be captured using those trademark anime speech patterns. With Yamadera, it just felt like someone who is acting like this is how a cool person sounds when he needs to be cool in order to stand out against those around him. 
And it doesn't help that, in the rest of the Japanese version, such a gritty, dog-eat-dog -dog world is littered with people who carry with them that same overdone upswing in their conversations that will never sound 100% natural to me in a story like this. <laughs> If anything, the only character that can come off as believable by relying on that is Ed. Hi! <laughs> She's bubbly, spontaneous, and is even animated differently than the rest of the characters. But that type of performance works for her because she's supposed to contrast the rest of the crew. A child who hasn't yet been exposed to the unreliable facets of adult life. Melissa Fawn plays the character like she's in her own little perfect bubble, while everyone else is frustrated about constantly being pulled out of theirs by the cruel world around them. And it happens so consistently that they eventually just get used to it. Free to me! My money! I'll pay you when I'm rich! I'm not again. Faye's introduction is probably the best example of this. She struts into a shop with several shots of the store owner eyeing up her body, then she pulls out a machine gun while saying this. You know the first rule of combat? Shoot them before they shoot you. This sets her up as this super sexy yet dangerous femme fatale, but in literally the next shot, she's surrounded by more hoodlums and gets caught. Quite an elaborate way to get acquainted. And from that point on, for every one of those femme fatale moments, there are at least ten other moments of her complaining, whining, and just generally being a pathetic loser. Damn it! Why is everyone in such a hurry all the time? Don't they know it's unhealthy? That means that Wendy Lee needed to constantly overplay herself in order to properly display the same degree of unfound confidence in a way that acted as the perfect foil to Steve. Those two never recorded in the same room at the same time, but their opposing attitudes and approaches to their respective characters meshed so well together that you'd almost never believe it. Hey, Gaojo. Hello, Romany. Acting itself is the process of invoking reality in a certain kind of way so that the audience can feel their humanity represented on screen. But for the cast of Cowboy Bebop, they were all significantly betrayed in the past, and those events were so shocking to their own notion of reality that they just stopped caring about what's real anymore. Spike was betrayed by those who he considered closest to him, and because of that, doesn't let anybody in. Faye was betrayed by her lack of memories and constantly seeks to live in the moment, almost like she's desperate to leave her mark, while Ed was just literally abandoned without a care in the world. The only one that can hold them together for a while is the owner of the Bebop itself, a man by the name of Jet Black, who arguably was betrayed by… well, everybody. This was a guy that was considered the best in every field, yet was still tossed aside when his previous life just didn't have a use for him anymore. He never did anything wrong, but sometimes that doesn't always guarantee that things will work out the way you want them to. Now, the only solace he can find is in looking after those who are just as lost as he is. I wonder what you call this kind of relationship. It's not like we have any camaraderie. There isn't really a bond here at all. Everyone just does what they want to do. They come back whenever they feel like it, and then they take off again. Even though Bo Billingsley can still come off as very low and distant, he also approached the role with a very subtle sense of warm comfort. In an interview, he mentioned how Jet's interactions with the rest of the crew reminded him of how he interacted with his own kids, and it's that personal mindset that shines through in his acting above all else. I'm the black dog, and when I bite, I don't let go. I have no regrets about her, but I'll settle this score on my own turf. He wasn't just playing another random tough guy with a good heart. He was playing the glue that kept this fictional family together for as long as he did, until he just couldn't anymore. Even though many were unaware of what was going on behind the scenes, I think it's that almost unconscious sense of personal resonance for the material that made everyone involved create something that we almost can't imagine the community without. So much so that we almost take for granted about how it came to be. To this day, I'm still confronted with people who honestly make the argument that this particular dub only turned out as well as it did because the studio shelled out the extra money for more high-profile talent. And after looking at the history of how early dubs got produced, I can assure people that this almost never happened back then. Hell, there's no evidence that it even really happens now. 
Nowadays, when we consider voice acting juggernauts like Steve Bloom, having voiced some of the most powerful personalities in animation, and even holding a world record for the most voice acting roles in video games, it's almost impossible to come to terms with the truth about how his career actually started. Back in the 90s, Steve wasn't a seasoned veteran who had lofty aspirations of breaking out into the industry. Rather, he was just an average mailroom clerk who happened to be at the right place at the right time. He was hired for his very first voice acting job after someone overheard him do silly voices with his friends. In fact, even long after working on Bebop, Steve didn't really consider himself an actor on par with the people he's learned from, due to the fact that he went through most of his career without any formal training. But uh, you still obviously learned a lot. Mm -hmm. You just didn't learn it in school. No. You learned it in the studio watching other people work. And it took me 15 years before I really considered myself to be an actor. But I was learning, you know, so I, I, I look back on those years as, you know, part of my schooling. And I, I didn't go to school in the traditional way, but 15 years of doing it in the booth was incredible training. A lot of people like to discredit those who work on anime dubs today right off the bat because they haven't been trained in the art specifically for most of their lives compared to the Japanese. That's mostly because, here in the West, dubbing is a low-paying subsection of the animation industry, while in Japan, it's the status quo. But it's funny that the experiences of those behind the mic show that things aren't as clear-cut as a lot of sub-purists would like them to believe. Just as Steve and the rest of the dubbing crew were working in an industry with no guarantees, the Bebop crew had no guarantee that they'd be able to earn enough money for their next meal. What better people to be considered the definitive versions of these characters than ones working in the same kind of uneasy environment? When asked what he wanted to communicate through this show, Watanabe responded by saying, People see a lot of things over time. They find things they like, and these days, people try to recreate what they've seen. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to create something that had never been seen before. Just like how the show itself flew in the face of typical anime conventions to give more people a glimpse of what the medium is capable of, the English dub was one of the first to show that when you have the right people working on the right show at precisely the right time, the end result can turn out great regardless of the circumstances surrounding it. Bang. And the best part was that it didn't end there. Dubbing anime has become more involved and commercialized than it ever has been before. But that doesn't mean there still aren't people out there who continue to be placed in similar circumstances. Whether you're formally trained or not, the process isn't always perfect, and the quality might vary from show to show. But sometimes things can never be boiled down to a simple formula or excuse. I mean, isn't that part of the reason why we love anime to begin with? Between horrible working conditions and an oversaturated industry focused on pandering to the lowest common denominator, sometimes it's a miracle that some shows turn out as well as they do. Things are never as simple as we would like them to be, and anime dubbing is no different. The whole sub versus dub argument is kind of like racism. It's incredibly stupid, those found on both sides can be completely deaf to the other, and if we're being honest with ourselves, it'll never truly die out. A lot of people claim that Bebop is overrated, and maybe some sub-purists are sick of seeing it brought up as an exception to their rules year after year. But if we're going to keep having these arguments anyway, then why not have them with as much context as possible? Whether you like it or not, anime dubs continue to play a part in our appreciation of the medium itself, and with so many around now more than ever, there's no way I intend to stop delving into this underappreciated part of the industry. In fact, we're just getting started. So just like Spike and the rest of the Bebop crew, we need to do our best to carry that weight, with one eye firmly on the past, while the other looks towards the future. After all, if there's one thing we can take away from this dub, it's how important it is to understand where we came from, before we can truly start talking about where it is that we're going. Obviously, there are other people that play a part in all of this, like the script adapters and producers, but naturally not everything can be covered in just one sitting. Thankfully, we have a lot more videos like this planned for the near future, so if this one got you curious, feel free to subscribe and follow us on Twitter for more info.